In 1991, NASA launched the Space Shuttle Columbia, which happened to have some very unique cargo on it. The craft orbited Earth with a total of 2,478 jellyfish polyps. In order to test a bizarre yet intriguing hypothesis, would microgravity majorly affect the development of jellyfish? These creatures were placed within bags and flasks filled with artificial seawater that allowed them to swim freely due to the chemicals placed inside. The polyps were able to reproduce because of this and mature over time. This was a test if other organisms could be reproduced while in space, with the lower gravity and motion abnormalities. The jellyfish still, of course, experienced vertigo, but by the conclusion of the experiment, over 60,000 jellies had been reproduced while floating above Earth's atmosphere. In one of my previous videos, I mentioned an experiment from Mythbusters that never aired. It involved giving three test groups made up of rodents different substances to eat. Their normal food, sugary cereal, and pellets from the cardboard box that contains that cereal. This results in one of the mice eating the other two in that final test group. Now why do I mention this? Well because this rodent related study has them consuming another questionable substance. This 2011 study started with an apparatus that gave control to instrumental preferences. The choices? Between classic composer Beethoven and American trumpet player Miles Davis. After this, all of the rats were given 10 milligrams of cocaine to listen to the music they didn't prefer. A different conditioning had other rats be given saline and listen to the music they did prefer. The results were, to say the least, interesting. A few of the test subjects preferred silence over the instrumentals after repeated cocaine use. Overall, they were able to get some of the rats to want more of the powder with the cues of the music. It's such an odd study, and that's all I really have to say. A psychologist named Winthrop Niles Kellogg had been wanting to conduct an experiment where a child would be raised with no human contact at all. It would be just them, alone, in the wild. But instead, Winthrop decided to go to the complete opposite route. In June 1931, he added a fourth member to his family, a seven and a half month old chimpanzee named Guia. He and his wife wanted to see how this primate would develop if raised alongside their 10 month old son, Donald. Over the course of this 9 month study, the chimp was able to develop many human-like traits, but this wasn't enough for Kellogg. She just didn't meet his expectations, but Guia was still excelling in the test when compared to Donald, but not for a good reason. It seems this negatively affected his intelligence, as the boy even began mimicking the chimp's calls. This is what ended the experiment early, even though Guia was more dependent on human interaction than her adoptive brother. Though many feared that she would soon harm Donald because of her growing strength and manageability in comparison. To this day, the study is seen as a success, even though it only was slightly. Guia was returned to Robert Yerkes to the Primate Center in Florida. She died a year later in 1933 due to phenomia. She was only three. During the 1960s, there was an attempt to made to study turkeys by two scientists. Dr. Martin Shen and Dr. Edward Hale. And what did they do to study about these Thanksgiving weirdos? Well, these two wanted to know what their sex lives were like. Yep, you heard that correctly. So in some earlier experiments involving turkeys, they found out how freaky they really are. Males would pretty much try to have sex with anything living they see. Not just female turkeys, humans, and sometimes both at the same time. A lot of this is due to human imprinting, which occurs when a young turkey is exposed to a human not too long after birth. So for this study, the scientists made taxidermy females and placed them in the pens with the males, just to see what happens. And as you would expect, they performed necrophilia, just cause they felt like it. After this, the scientists wanted to further look into what attracts a male turkey, so they began taking off body parts of the taxidermies to see what their reactions would be. First the feet, then the wings, up until there was nothing left but the head and neck on a stick. And guess what happened? They still tried to hump it. Apparently the reason behind this was that the head is the only thing male turkeys see while mating. Oh, and they repeated the same experiment on chickens, and the opposite happened. They were totally fine boning a headless mate. This test started out pretty simply and innocent. It starts with NASA funding a project to have dolphin communication with humans. It began in 1964 with a woman named Margaret Howe Lovett and her dolphin Peter. Research started pretty simply by making a working desk that hung over the water and setting up sleeping arrangements. Margaret was fully dedicated to this and would spend three months by the tank, including sleeping next to it. Now if you know about dolphins, then you can recall how messed up they are, especially with human women. 
Also, Peter was sexually maturing, which made things complicated for the experiment. I mean, when your test subject would rather fornicate than learn to speak, you failed. This happened so much so that Margot would have to relieve himself of his urges instead of waiting. Peter would rub himself on her knee, and she would scratch him. And still, attempts to this day for a fold off a of communication with humans has failed. Also from the 1960s were various studies from one Jose Manuel Rodriguez Delgado, a brilliant man hailing from Spain whose education took him to none other than Yale. He focused on neural roots of pain, aggression, response, and lack thereof of various brain implanted primates and cats. But his main study would be on bulls, which leads us to our main topic. It took place in 1964 with Cordoba, Spain, on a ranch owned by Don Ramon Sanchez. Surgery was performed on the bulls, where a stemosiever was implanted into their brains. This apparently allowed him to remotely control the stimulus of the bulls' brains that caused aggression, so he decided to test this out in a very cocky display that was filmed. Jose would have the bulls charge at him before pressing the remote control button, which would stop the raging beast in its tracks. The study has been argued over a little bit over the years, but the video and other proof presented by Jose says otherwise. It has been said that it was easier to just block motor function than feelings, so who knows. Further expanding on the topic of mind control is one more fitting in science fiction that is now science fact. Researchers at Singapore's Nayang Technological University found a way to remotely control beetles. In 2015, it was revealed how this was done. Giant flower beetles have miniature computers and wireless transmitters secured to their backs in order to determine their brain function. Various information regarding this was captured due to neuromuscular data. For example, it was determined that the muscle which controlled folding of the wings is the same for steering. With this and other data inputs, researchers were able to remotely control the beetles like a toy helicopter. This was done with specific conditions, as the test bugs were in a closed room with eight 3D cameras. Signals were transmitted from their backs every millisecond allowing for smooth controls and room for turns and other maneuvers. Maybe someday there will be full-on human mind control. This one is simple but more fucked up. During the 1960s, the peak of animal experiments seemingly, a team of scientists wondered how to stop an aggressive captive elephant. So they used a 14-year-old Indian elephant named Tusco, who resided at the Lincoln Park Zoo. Can you guess what substance they decided to sedate the large mammal with? If you guessed lysuric acid diaphylamide, aka LSD, then you were right. A high amount of acid was inserted into Tesco, up to a whole milligram. In context, that's over 20 times the amount it takes for a person to experience hallucinations. The scientists themselves even acknowledged that this amount could cause an overdose, which it did. Tesco began seizuring, so he was injected with promazine. This stopped some of the symptoms, so they injected him again with pentobarbital. An hour and 40 minutes after this all began, the elephant died. You may have actually heard of this one, The Pits of Despair. It began with several studies during the 1950s and 60s by one messed up Harry Harlow. He wanted to further understand social relationships between mothers and their young. Are newborns attracted to their mothers because they provide food? Or is it due to natural emotional reasons? To test this, Harlow separated various newborn rhesus monkeys from their mothers and placed them in small confinement. There were numerous ones placed in a laboratory where the young would have no outside contact at all. Many just circled their cages, stared at nothing, and even inflicted harm upon themselves. Afterwards, they were placed in groups of fellow test subjects and mostly refused to interact with each other. Some even starved to death after refusing to eat. A second study was done where Harlow decided to add certain things in their cages. Two conditions were set. One or a mother made of wood and wire would contain a milk bottle, the other one being made of cloth and foam rubber. In the second condition, the cloth mother had a milk bottle, and it was observed that the mother made of cloth and foam tended to be the one newborn preferred. In 1971, Harlow would return to these experiments due to his wife dying. He wanted to study depression, so he developed the pits of despair. Monkeys were isolated and imprisoned for an entire month. All they did really was eat and huddle in the corner. After this, they still had, quote unquote, Profound behavioral abnormalities. Honestly, this guy is pure evil. These next three entries deal with experiments on pets. You have been warned. 
In the early 1800s, a strange figure named Carl August Weinhold would perform gruesome Frankenstein-like experiments on cats to bring them back to life. He started with a three-week-old kitten. Carl first sliced open the head and took out its spinal cord, replacing it with a mixture of copper and zinc. A battery was used to stimulate these muscles, causing the decapitated kitten's body to start jerking around the table. Due to these results, Carl decided to take things one step further. He used a full-grown cat this time and took out a portion of its brain with a spoon. Then, like last time, a mixture of copper and zinc replaced the spinal cord. Its muscles would move, but it obviously didn't come back to life. Carl thought so, stating that he completely reanimated it. Now this information primarily came from the man himself, so it's not completely confirmed, but I at least think this really happened. In 1954, Soviet scientist Vladimir Demikov began his attempts to create a two-headed dog. He was to transplant part of one on top of the other to create his own monster. In previous years, he has had transplanted various organs between dogs, but he wanted to go one step further. The first subject was a German shepherd named Brodyaga, which is literally the word tramp in Russian. The second, much smaller dog named Shavka had its entire lower half amputated, with its own heart and lungs only remaining until the transplant started. Shavka would be attached to Brodyaga via the lower neck, and both would share the vital organs. After the three and a half hour long operation, both dogs were still somehow alive and had full control of all main senses. However, Shavka was not connected to Brodyaga's stomach, so anything that went into her body would come out through the external tube. The creature had a neck vein which got damaged, meaning that it only survived four days, but it was theorized that it could have lived much longer. This wasn't the first time Soviets experimented with transplanting dogs. In 1928, a group led by Sergei Sergevich Bernaneko was able to revive a decapitated dog through the bizarre method. It was a device called the autojector, which is made up of two diaphragm pumps with a system of valves that would pump blood in and out of the head. The dog would even react to things moving around him, lick its lips, and even swallow a piece of cheese. We know about all of this due to a 1941 short film from the Soviet Film Agency. During the 1930s and beyond, various other successful attempts were made to do the same, specifically one from 2005 by American scientists. One of the dogs supposedly even regained consciousness, but it's hard to find information about that one. But this experiment in particular has good intentions, since this type of treatment could save lives one day due to serious injury. Dogs are the only creatures that have had transplants done on them in this gruesome of a manner. In 1970, a man named Robert J. White created four experiments in which he attempted to transplate the head of one monkey onto another. However, the nervous systems were never connected, just the blood vessels. Because of this, the monkey was completely paralyzed and needed a machine to keep it alive, and said machine was only able to help it for eight days until it just died. It's just that the immune system never fully cooperated and gave up. Many other scientists at the time criticized Robert for the experiment, seeing it as unethical and savage, but to this day, many head transplant surgeries are still tested, including some on lab mice. 